Aloha everyone, it is Ajanette and I am here to go over your Human Sexuality Chapter 20 lecture. This week we are going to cover ability, intersectionality, body image, and reclaiming our bodies. I'd like to share a quote with you, it's a little blurry, sorry. Um, we live at these complex intersections of size, class, race, ethnicity, age, gender identity, ability, and sexuality. These identities impact the ways we engage with the world and our ability to feel at home in our own bodies. Oh, sit with that for a second. It's so, so, so important. These intersectional identities shape a huge aspect of our identities overall as sexual creatures and beings and our sense of sexual empowerment. And when we're talking about these things, we often leave out conversations about ability. In fact, sometimes we make assumptions that individuals of varying ability don't have an interest in sexual relations, or we don't prioritize understanding their sexual needs and empowering them with appropriate education and resources. So it's important that we bring people into the conversation who represent a diversity across each of these identities and allow them to be active contributing members of the work that we produce in this field. Now, when we're talking about people of varying ability, you may have otherwise heard that referenced as disability. Now, mind you that individuals that have varying abilities may not see themselves as disabled. They may just see themselves as experiencing the world differently. For example, people in the deaf community do not necessarily look at the state of being deaf as a disability. They feel, some, not all, right? They feel as if they just experience the world differently. So they don't want to be disparaged. They don't want to be stigmatized. They don't want to be underestimated and they don't want to be included from these conversations. So I do want you to expand your awareness, expand your appreciation for diversity, even in terms of ability as we navigate this conversation today. So when we talk about varying abilities, a mental health and psychological health are critical to our health and functioning, right? Including our sexual functioning. <clears throat> Um, anxiety, depression, substance use disorders, those are some of the most common conditions people experience. And collectively, people experience greater rates of psychological disorders um, than they do many, many physical health conditions that warrant prominent conversation and attention in society today. So I want you to think about um, either yourself or the people around you who might be coping with anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, ADHD, any type of trauma, schizophrenia, substance dependence, or any other psychological condition. And think about how that impacts them, how that impacts them psychologically, how that impacts them academically, how that impacts them professionally, socially, and how that impacts them sexually, right? If you yourself have experienced any of these conditions, draw upon that and maybe relate to people who might have other diverse conditions. For example, I am a recent breast cancer survivor. Well, they don't call me survivor yet. Um, that's a whole other story, but I actually have to go in for another biopsy. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed. But that being said, um, <clears throat> uh, I had a surgery and I had radiation and my breasts are physically altered as a result. Sometimes I use the word mangled, but that's not very affirming and empowering language, right? But I've, I've gone through um, a tremendous amount of emotional healing 
after my, my breast surgery. Uh, and certainly the way in which my body looks and as, as a single woman going through breast cancer alone, um, you know, I'm mindful that I'm in the dating world and that impacts my, um, uh, attractiveness, my confidence and my future sexual relationships. And so that and the resulting PTSD has definitely uh, impacted me in a way that has a direct influence on my, my sexual functioning. And so those are things to consider, right? So when you are experiencing any of these conditions, me personally, I had PTSD um, and I was living in, living in constant fear of cancer and sadly, what that did was it, um, it made me uh, hesitant. You know, first of all, I was managing such PTSD and anxiety. Um, I don't know that I could have a healthy uh, romantic or sexual relationship. And so I had to navigate that with a therapist. And um, it's important to understand that the way in which these, our self-perception changes as a result of these varying conditions can directly impact our sexual um, functioning and identities and empowerment, or maybe a current flare-up such as if you're experiencing a bout of depression, but you may not have any interest in sexual uh, relations at the time. So your desires, your interests, your functioning may be impacted. And sometimes that is a symptom of the condition, or sometimes it's actually a symptom or result of the treatment, a side effect of the treatment that you are using, whether it's antidepressants impacting your sex drive or something like me, um, the physical uh, outcome of the surgery and how that might impact my sexual identity. Um, and um, my, my sexual confidence and body image. Okay, uh, other um, conditions like bipolar disorder might actually impact um, increased risk-taking behavior, including sexually, right? So uh, particularly when someone's experiencing mania, they may engage in risk-taking behavior, like driving fast on the freeway, not wearing seat belts, um, gambling away their money, impulse shopping, and sometimes high-risk sexual behavior where they're engaging uh, in unprotected sex with many um, maybe familiar or unfamiliar sexual partners, all of which increases their risk, right? Um, they might also uh, experience challenges in the relationship, um, maybe even something like ADHD, right? Uh, um, the, the inability to focus in any given time may be frustrating to a partner or, um, you know, maybe that partner is misinterpreting that and taking that personally and, um, seeing that as a sign that the individual with ADHD doesn't care. And that's not the case at all. They literally, uh, just struggle with all of that other information that needs to be filtered out so they can focus and attune their attention uh, and resources to the person at hand and the relationship at hand. Or um, again, maybe the medications one is taking, um, whether sometimes those are prescribed medications like the antidepressants with side effects, or sometimes it's someone self-medicating through um, drug and alcohol uh, use. And then, of course, the body image um, that I mentioned earlier. Note that uh, some symptoms can increase, like when you have a manic episode, uh, your sexual drive might go up, and some, in some circumstances, depending upon the health condition, like depression, your sexual desires might be um, suppressed. Uh, you, so your responsiveness to sex and... Um, and the way in which you're engaging in your sexual relationship might, might change based upon the symptoms of a particular psychological disorder. Okay, so um, when we're talking about, I think that that was kind of out of order, we should have flip-flopped, um, but when we're talking about ability, 
Um, keep in mind that includes neurodivergence. Uh, and so uh, that can be someone uh, who is on the autism spectrum, right? Uh, or it can be physical differences that one might experience. Um, I had a student with cerebral palsy one time who asked me to help her shop for a vibrator. And at first I thought, oh, this is an area where I've had privilege and I probably um, was committing microaggressions and leaving her out of the conversation sometimes as it related to sexuality. And so I'm glad that in other areas of the class, I was able to create a sense of space. I mean, excuse me, a sense of um, comfort, safety, and intimacy. She felt comfortable to come to me and ask me for such a private uh, resource and support. And so I happily helped her uh, find one that could be helpful for her particular um, physical abilities. Additionally, when we're talking about varying degrees of ability, it affects how you perceive yourself, right? And that, of course, our self-perception has a direct impact on our sexual identities and our sexual relationships and behavior. Note that ability is not fixed, right? It varies, it changes, it can be related to a particular um, circumstance in your life, right? A particular condition that waxes and wanes, like a psychological disorder, um, where you're not always in depression, but you have depressive episodes. It can be something such as my breast cancer, right? Where um, my m all my years prior to the cancer, um, I I had a um, I was very comfortable with my breasts, and then thereafter, I wasn't. Give me just one second. When you're talking about ability, also be mindful that there's visible and invisible continuums, right? So um, I always get frustrated when people gripe and complain about somebody parking in a handicapped spot. You don't know what other conditions that individual might have, short or long term. You don't know. There are all kinds of invisible conditions that impact people's abilities. And so don't be such a judgy bitch, right? Mind your business uh, and also be respectful and not, not utilize those spaces for convenience, but out of respect for individuals who need them, right? Uh, but do keep in mind that there are lots of conditions. People don't see my breast visibly unless I'm standing naked in front of you, right? Um, people don't see my PTSD, um, but it's there. Um, people don't see my dad's bipolar, but it's there. And people don't see my friend's heart condition, but it's there. So please be mindful of those things. Also, just like any other abil or identity, excuse me, um, ability intersects with the rest of our identities. So a person of color who is in a wheelchair might face additional barriers than a white person that's in a wheelchair, right? They're dealing with stigma, discrimination, prejudice, bias, exclusion, um, microaggressions, um, being left out, um, not just because of their, their physical uh, state, but also their race. And so uh, we have to be mindful of that. And I think it's important to broaden our perspectives. Ability has been one of the identities that I probably have not focused on as much in my teaching career. And I would say it's because historically, it was an area of privilege for me. And sometimes those identities where we have privilege, we fail to realize the challenges and barriers that others may face. So uh, another thing that's really, really important to consider is the lack of representation, right? In media, um, in positions of power, such as the White House or Congress or uh, powerful judicial positions, 
we often do not have individuals who uh, are, are publicly sharing their conditions and circumstances that that reflect diverse identities in this area. And so consequently, we often, um, when there's lack of representation and there's lack of voice and advocacy, they're often left out of very critical conversations and important areas of focus for academia and otherwise. And human sexuality is one of those areas. And so we have to recognize that they have just as much right and need to explore their sexuality as anybody else. And it's really important that we uh, are inclusive and that we not make assumptions, but just like any other identity, empower the individual uh, to share their own needs uh, and their own um, wishes and concerns as well so that we can respond accordingly. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I myself was not attentive in this area. Um, and I'm thankful that that student helped to educate me, right? And raise my awareness. Uh, I think it's important to note that sometimes we infantilize people that might have either a physical or a psychological condition where they're viewed as, um, sometimes not just less than capable, but less than normal and less than human. And that's not okay, right? They have all the same needs and desires uh, as any other individual, and they can be intentionally or otherwise desexualized by their caregivers. Their parents may not see them as sexual creatures. Their teachers may not see them as sexual uh, creatures. Their healthcare workers may not see them as sexual creatures. And so that area of need is often left unaddressed entirely. And that can lead to problems because it can make them vulnerable in terms of sexual exploitation and abuse. And it can also make them vulnerable in terms of not being given the opportunity to make informed, empowered decisions with their bodies. Just like I tell you uh, as, as a class, I want you to be able to make informed, empowered decisions, educated, empowered decisions with your body. That, that applies to all of us, all of us of varying identities, race, ethnicity, ability, um, you know, education, all of our identities, religion. I want you all to make informed, educated, empowered decisions with your body. I need to fix some typos here. Um, when we desexualize individuals of varying abilities, it's important to note that this can be done unconsciously, right? Um, it doesn't mean necessarily the person is trying to be ignorant, although I'm not in denial. I know there are people who are intentionally and deliberately um, trying to deny individuals their, their sexual rights. Uh, and so, um, I'm not in any way, uh, naive about that, but often it might be unintentional. They just didn't think about it. So we can, by promoting inclusion and awareness and education and advocacy and self-advocacy, we can help to educate the community and society at large, right? Uh, and make sure that we are not objectifying anybody um, and that we are not in any way marginalizing their voices or their sexual identities and, need, uh, and needs. So um, individuals of varying abilities need education. Uh, they need education on their bodies. They need to be educated about boundaries and consent, particularly if they're in, in a circumstance where they are relying on caretakers and healthcare workers. They 100% should be given autonomy and voice over their own bodies. And they need access to healthy, broad education and resources that allow them to explore their own sexual identities 
and to engage in healthy sexual behavior. So here's some things to consider. Um, we need to, at just in general for society, provide tools so that we have greater awareness of mental health diagnoses. We need to help people understand their various conditions, the side effects, right? We need to normalize and validate talking about it, talking about their feelings, talking about their experiencing experiences, allowing their voices and experiences to be represented in the larger social conversations and narratives. We need to educate them about hypervigilance and trauma responses, um, particularly those who have experienced some sort of trauma, um, particularly sexual trauma and abuse. That hypervigilance and the triggers uh, and the resulting impact on their autonomic nervous system can impact their relationships. So we need to teach them to be aware of how those, um, those triggers might be uh, causing their body to respond a certain way. We need to give them the tools and techniques so that they can manage their responses in a healthy way. Um, give them a toolbox so that they can actually determine which tools make the most sense for them and how they want to deal with their trauma responses in a healthy, empowered way. And just overall use those tools to support their well-being, right? Um, and then we also need to kind of provide holistic education for everybody across identities, holistic support. And when I'm talking holistic, think about physical, cognitive, social, emotional, spiritual, um, psychological, and sexual, right? They need all of it. Uh, and that will, that will help um, promote wellness for all of their identities in considering, um, and I'm not talking about necessarily, when I'm talking about all of their identities, I'm talking about they should um, be able to have an empowered sense of self with their unique intersection of identities, race, ethnicity, uh, culture, religion, age, gender identity, sex, um, and sexual identities and ability. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so ability intersects with all those other identities and when we're addressing their holistic needs, we want to make sure that everybody across those diverse identities has access to good, uh, good, comprehensive uh, sexual education and resources. Okay, now um, we talked a little bit about some psychological health, probably a little bit out of order. I think these slides are out of order, um, but also physical health conditions, uh, you know, People that have physical health conditions, some may have pain, some may experience pain during intercourse. Um, some may have differing abilities that impact their sexual encounters and relationships. Some might impact their sexual functioning. Um, some might impact their sexual interest. Sometimes conditions can be chronic or acute. So when we talk about acute, they're sudden. They're usually short term. Um, chronic are usually long term, enduring. Some can be lifelong. Um, definitely in some situations, there's a capacity for healing and a capacity for uh, some degree of recovery and some conditions there aren't. So these are all things to discuss and consider. Again, those visible and invisible conditions that exist across the spectrum that could impact sexuality. And then also um, think about, you know, your sexual functioning can also be an indication of physical health, right? So we're, we're kind of talking about this in terms of physical conditions that may impact sexual functioning, but also sexual functioning can alert you to physical conditions, right? So sometimes erectile dysfunction can, or lack of sexual interest can be uh, an indication that there might be cardiovascular issues, there might be um, cancer or autoimmune issues that could be uh, causing that uh, that change to your sexual functioning. Diabetes, which is, you know, uh, um, oh gosh, what was the, 
I cannot think of the word, forgive me, it's been a long time since I was a medical assistant. It'll come to me. Multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, um, even like visual or auditory differences such as, um, you know, the blind community, the deaf community, spinal cord injuries. Um, sometimes, you know, you might have paralysis of different areas of your body that may impact uh, sexual functioning. Of course, it's not our place to ask individuals uh, what type of um, abilities they may or may not have in the sexual arena, but most definitely it's our responsibility uh, as a society to make sure that they have access to education and resources that meet their sexual needs and can support their sexual desires and functioning um, even given these, these um, uh, varying abilities. Um, and then also, again, <clears throat> just as my breast cancer or my PTSD or, um, you know, the analogies or the examples I've given you can impact body image, other conditions can too. Um, and not just the, the abilities, right, but the way that we treat them in society. Uh, can impact their body image as well. And, you know, maybe they, um, they are uh, conditioned to believe that, you know, they, they aren't supposed to be sexual. Maybe they're conditioned to deny their sexual uh, interests, desires, urges. And so, you know, uh, they're not given the full opportunity to explore the range of identities and interests that they, that they may have. Um, oh, that's another thing. If you have a caregiver or if you have a romantic partner that becomes a caregiver, that can also impact the relationship. I saw that happen, um, with my sister and her wife. When her wife became a caregiver to my sister and facilitating her injections, um, through chemo, uh, and, and other support activities, um, it does change the nature of the sexual relationship. And so it's important to be able to have open conversation, uh, seek the support of a therapist and potentially even a sex therapist as needed. Most people don't know that what a sex therapist is. A sex therapist is not a therapist that you have sex with. Okay. Let's just dispel that. A sex therapist is a therapist that specializes in empowering and educating individuals uh, about healthy sexual activities. Um, it, it's somebody that specializes. It, unfortunately, not all therapists are com comfortable talking about sex. I'm sure you've taken classes where some teachers aren't comfortable talking about sex or when sex is there, even in intro psych. They might skip over the human sexuality part. They may not go through the full sexual response cycle, right? They may not talk about the incredibly brave research that Masters and Johnson did had, had, you know, with people masturbating in MRI machines, right? They may not talk about that. Me, I'm very comfortable talking about that. And so when you think about those things, um, sex therapists, are therapists that really do specialize in understanding how various circumstances and conditions can, can impact sexual relationships and sexual functioning. And their, their focus is, is sexual education and sexual empowerment. So it's possible if we're providing holistic care and support for individuals of varying ability that directing them to a therapist or, a, you know, a gynecologist or a urologist or a doctor that can actually um, provide inclusive sex education is, it could be a wonderful resource. And believe it or not, Planned Parenthood can be a wonderful resource for inclusive sex education as well. So just things to think about. I do want to talk a little bit about grief because grief can impact uh, sexual functioning, right? Um, and we're, when we grieve, it's not just grieving the death of a loved one. It can be grieving uh, the loss of a body part, such as a breast. It can be um, grieving the loss of functioning, such as if you become um, a paraplegic or a quadriplegic. It can be 
um, grieving the sexual intimacy that you had with a partner who is now um, who is now experiencing a health condition that might change the dynamic of your sexual relationship, right? Uh, it can be grieving after we are diagnosed or maybe even after we're treated and we recognize that we're changed forever after that treatment. So grief can come um, as a result of a number of losses in our life or a number of uh, major traumas or transitions in our life. The state of grief means giving yourself that time and space to uh, process the emotions associated with that loss and transition to validating those emotions uh, and and coming to healthy resolution with the grief. Grief doesn't go away, right? But we find ways to cope with that grief. We find ways to move on beyond the grief, but the grief doesn't necessarily go away. Sometimes it stays with us, maybe in our pocket um, for a time, maybe as a cloak over a time in our lives. So it can be bigger or smaller depending upon the season. Some people expect grief to, you know, go through those Kubler-Ross stages and they think they're linear and sequential. They're not. Grief looks more like this on the right for many, many, many people where you think you're doing well and then all of a sudden something takes you down and then all of a sudden you're going down memory lane and then all of a sudden you're grieving every other um, memory and loss uh, that you have of a person, a condition, a situation. Sometimes um, you go all the way back to the beginning and feel that trauma and pain all over. Sometimes you go a little bit, you, you know, you take a couple steps back, um, but it can be, uh, it can, can take any path for anyone. And so be careful not to impose expectations upon others. Um, be careful um, not to be judgmental. Uh, and I'm saying that with some degree of hypocrisy as I'm watching my mother still grieve my father eight years later, right? So um, in truth and disclosure and vulnerability, um, know that I need to work on this too. So here's some resources. Um, I, here are the stages of grief consistent with what you're seeing here in this image. And then just some other resources related to grief. Um, as it, as it uh, impacts individuals who've been diagnosed with a chronic condition and illness. Okay, so as we know, um, identity intersects, uh, or there are many intersectional identities, or there are many identities that intersect, that's what I should say. Um, identities are social constructs, so they are concepts uh, that have been developed by society. They typically represent some sort of hierarchy, right? Uh, where within the race social construct, there's a clear hierarchy. Within the gender uh, social construct, there's a clear hierarchy. Sex, sexual identity, you know, all of that. Um, and also ability, right? Uh, and we often operate from a very egocentric perspective assuming that uh, everybody else is like us. So if we um, have the ability to walk, we assume everybody has the ability to walk. If we have the ability to see, we assume everybody has the ability to see. If we have the ability to sit down and focus our attention for an hour, we assume everybody has the ability to focus their, their attention for an hour. These things simply um, aren't universal. So what we have to be mindful of is those hierarchies exist um, and consequently people are marginalized and face tremendous oppression and they're uh, being denied access to critical information and resources that are readily available to some but not all. So in your respective disciplines, in your respective fields, uh, figure out what you can do to be inclusive. And I'm working on that too. So please help me along as I'm growing in that area of my life as well. And then also 
Um, think about the impact of colonization. We talked a lot about colonization and how it impacted gender identity. I also want you to consider how it impacted ability. Remember that at one point in our history, um, they scooped up anybody who had any type of psychological or physical condition that they did not deem to be quote unquote normal. And individuals of varying ability have been institutionalized. Um, they have been subject to forced sterilization. Uh, they have been denied access and rights. Their own families have been uh, ashamed and stigmatized. Uh, the individuals and they have received stigma from the community as well. So what society has viewed as a flaw has caused tremendous trauma toward uh, millions of human beings around the globe. And so we need to be mindful of that. And, and some of that is a direct result of colonization and of the, the attempt to kind of um, compartmentalize and sterilize um, this concept of what is a normal human and it, let's go back to even normal American, right? And it's not okay. So uh, please be, be open to advocating uh, where you might have a voice and opportunity and make sure that uh, we are um, able to, to critically examine an historical and current ways in which uh, this population is marginalized uh, and, and advocate for a more positive, inclusive society moving forward. Here are some additional resources your authors have provided um, for resistance and to encourage us to resist the colonial mindsets and adopt a more inclusive society, including reclaiming a positive body image for ourselves, regardless of ability, regardless of race and ethnicity, regardless of size, regardless of gender identity, right? We all have a right to feel beautiful. We all have a right to feel comfortable in our own bodies. We all have a right to be free of social comparisons, free of hatred imposed upon us because our bodies don't fit a typical ideal that is really just some artificial bullshit imposed on us. Um, it's amazing to me, particularly as a psychologist, when you look at eating disorders and the impact of American beauty standards on individuals' mental health and well-being, when you look at the impact of social media on mental health and well-being, particularly that of our young women in society. A lot of it comes from this artificial concept of beautiful and the forced um, beauty standards uh, that we are expected to live up to when even models are being airbrushed in their pictures. They're even making models who are already typically well below their uh, recommended weight, right? And they're still, their pictures are not quote unquote, good enough, pretty enough, skinny enough. So I say, fuck it all, right? Learn how to love our bodies just as they are. Learn how to compare us not to others, but to ourselves. Learn how to challenge those cognitive um, deceptions, those distortions that are happening when we start to tell ourselves we're not skinny enough, we're not pretty enough, um, we're to this and to that, right? Learn how to counter those narratives. Recognize, have that self-awareness that you are being harsh and critical and abrasive with yourself. Reframe that self-consciousness. Give yourself positive affirmations and adopt and reclaim an, an empowered, empowered, um, body image and narrative within ourselves and resist that media image, resist that narrative we get 
um, from media. So I want to direct your attention over here to the right of the screen. And I want you to say these out loud with me. My body is the least interesting thing about me. I have a brain. I have a sense of humor. I have incredible endurance and resilience. I am intellectual. I am a wonderful, compassionate soul. All of those things are far more interesting than my physical appearance. Number two. Anyone who doesn't see me for more than my body is not worthy of my time. If they can't appreciate the whole woman and all of the value that I bring, then be gone with them. Number three, I'm grateful for my smile, my eyes, my hands, my hips. I'm grateful for my feet that carry me, right? I am grateful for my brain that inspires me and inspires others. I'm grateful for my heart that keeps me alive and making a difference in this world every day. You own your own gratitude. Number four, my body is unique and doesn't need to look like anyone else's. Even my mangled breast, it's mine. And that scar represents my strength, my fortitude, my resilience, my tenacity. Number five, my worth has nothing to do with my appearance. I am worthy because I am alive and I am human and I breathe. I am worthy because I am a productive, powerful, incredible woman. I am worthy because I am. Number six, my body takes me places. My body has walked me all over the island of Hawaii, Kauai, and Oahu, and Maui. And soon, someday on the short list, it will walk me across the island of Molokai, Lanai, and I want to go to Tahiti, Fiji, New Zealand, and all the Pacific Islands. My body allows me to venture out and enjoy the world. When it comes to body image, know that your bodies are vessels. They're a canoe, right? They're taking you from one destination to the next, from one time in your life to the next. Society puts all these labels on us, fat, skinny, right? Apple, pear, like what the fuck, right? They politicize our bodies, they marginalize our bodies, and they dehumanize our bodies. But guess what? We don't have to internalize that bullshit. We get to assign the meaning to these marks on our bodies. What do those cellulite dimples represent to you? To me, these stretch marks, they represent birthing for children, the giver of life, creating life inside my body, my womb, and birthing them and bringing them forth into this world. These scars, oh my gosh, they represent some of them, some great times with some great people. They represent some powerful memories with my brother his loss, the pain of his loss, but the love that lives on inside of me. So what do your marks mean? Don't let the outside world define that for you. Define it for yourself. Try to find joy in the marks and the, the perceived imperfections, but they're not. They're just unique traits and qualities that are wholly you. We don't have to be beholden to those unrealistic beauty standards. Interestingly enough, women of color typically have healthier body images. Why? Because we have more realistic beauty ideals. Look at the big, beautiful black women that cover, um, you know, media images today. Uh, look at the way um, Chandra Rhimes has portrayed uh, women of color 
of varying body sizes, of varying identities, in strong, powerful roles. And they're still incredible sexual beings, right? So we have to practice that self-love. We have to practice that self-affirmation. Speak these affirmations out loud. Let your brain hear them. Let those positive statements tickle your eardrums because too often they don't have that pleasure and privilege. Practice self-compassion. Practice compassion and love toward others as well. Stop being so fucking critical of other people and call that shit out when you see it happening. When I hear people talking shit about a woman who is a little on the heavier side or maybe a lot on the heavier side and she's got her ass hanging out because she has booty shorts, I'm like more power to her. I wish I had her self-confidence. We don't need to shame her and say that's inappropriate or how dare she, as if only thin white bodies get to be on display. If you want to display your body and you have a bigger body and you have a brown body, by all means, you have a right to display it. And it is just as beautiful as any other body. So we need to call that shit out. We need to not participate in that shit with ourselves, not participate in that shit with others. And we need to make sure that we are advocating for more inclusive um, and healthy narratives around this moving forward. Uh, and, and don't internalize that stigma and shame. Let's work to undo it. So parting thoughts. I am not going to sacrifice my mental health to have the perfect body. And what the fuck is perfect anyway? Okay. I deserve to be confident and happy regardless of how my body looks and regardless of how my body might function. Hating your body doesn't change your body. Hating yourself doesn't make you any better. So accept yourself, accept your body, accept your abilities and start living for you, not how you look to others or how you're perceived by others. Let's reclaim our bodies and our minds. Let's reclaim all of ourselves, regardless of ability, invisible or otherwise. Let's reclaim our confidence, our self-love, our beauty. Let's reclaim our voice and our sexual empowerment. And let's advocate to ensure that others are given that opportunity as well. As usual, make sure you take detailed notes during your reading. Sorry that some of the slides were out of sequence for this one. I'll make it up to you next time. As you're watching this lecture video, I hope you've taken great notes. Submit those to your lecture notes assignment through the learning management system. Um, make sure you're including important vocabulary. Answer some of those reflection questions. And don't forget to submit the proposed test questions, not just in your assignment submission, but also, but also in the link that's provided to you. And then have fun with the learning activity this week. I'm excited to see what you all produce. Much love and aloha to all of you. Bye-bye.